Sorry for the technical glitches, everybody. Uh, Tiffany made this look a lot easier than it was, but welcome to another edition of Keep Looking Up. This week, we're going to be talking about galaxy interactions, and we're going to be talking about dark matter. Uh, you'll notice Tiffany is not here. Uh, we haven't heard anything, but we believe little Leon is either on the way or here already. Uh, we'll let you know when we hear something on that. But uh, joining us this evening uh, to help out with our little team here, uh, we have Nishan. Uh, he's going to be moderating for us. Uh, talking about dark matter this evening will be Eleni. She'll uh, hello. say hello, Eleni. And uh, guest starring with us this week is our planetarium director, Dr. Patrick Durrell, who will be talking about his field of speciality, which is galaxy interaction. It's fun stuff. So uh, we hope you, you guys will enjoy uh, what we've got going. Uh, I just have to do one little thing here, like so. Okay, there we go. And uh, I am going to be doing your star talk this evening. So uh, with that, let's take a look at the nighttime sky, some of the stuff you can see if you go outside tonight. Uh, I've got to get this one up here, like so. And I am going to uh, actually maximize this thing. There we go. And uh, I have a set for tonight here in Youngstown. At the time this show was supposed to start, which was 8 o'clock, I guess we're not off by that much. It's only 10 after. But uh, uh, we have been very, very lucky this month. We've had extremely good skies for uh, November. Of course, tonight's is not one of those nights. It is getting kind of cloudy out there um, tonight. But hopefully, uh, it looks like uh, around Thanksgiving, it is going to be pretty good to go out and take a look up at the nighttime sky. As you can see, I have you guys facing north up here. Uh, and actually, I want to do one thing here. I'm going to, oh no, you guys want to see me. I'll leave my video on. I turned it off there, but I'll bring it back on. My computer's being rather slow here. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, and uh, as we look to the northern sky at uh, eight o'clock, you'll notice right down here on the horizon. They got this tree in the way here. We have three stars to make a handle, four stars to make a cup. The Big Dipper is at its lowest point in the sky. This is low as the Big Dipper ever becomes in our sky, which means it's unlikely you'll be able to use it to find the most important star in the sky. And we, of course, all know that's uh, the North Star. We're going to take these two stars at the end. We're going to draw a line from the star at the bottom to the star at the top. And that will point you right at Polaris, uh, which is right there. Uh, Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky. As a matter of fact, it's the 47th or 48th brightest star in the sky. Uh, but it's always at this spot and the entire sky appears to rotate around it. So no matter what time of the night or what time of the year, anytime you go out to look at the nighttime sky, that star will always show you your direction. Uh, now, if you don't know how to find it, uh, when the Big Dipper is this low, we actually have something else we can use. If we move up a little bit higher in the sky, we have uh, these uh, very easy to spot stars up here. It looks like an M right now. Sometimes it looks like a W. Uh, this is uh, the constellation, and I've got to find my key uh, to do this, uh, which I believe is L. Nope. Mm. Well, this is the constellation Cassiopeia. I'm just not going to do the outlines. That'll make it easier. And Cassiopeia is very much like the Big Dipper. Cassiopeia is also always up in this part of the sky. She never sets. And like the Big Dipper, I actually have us in light polluted conditions here. If I come down here, I can actually take that off. You can see there's a lot more stars when I do that. But even in light polluted conditions, you can still pick that out. So you notice how this side of the W or M is steeper than this side. If you go to the steep part of the W over here, draw a line from the star here through the one in the middle and do a little bit of a curve, that also will point you right over at Polaris. And uh, because Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper are always up in this part of the sky and they never set. Uh, we have a special term for stars and patterns that do that. We call them circumpolar, 
big word I know, but circum means around like circumference and polar means Polaris. They're always up in the northern sky, so you can always find them when you look up there. All right, we're going to move a little bit to the west now. And as we come over to the west, you'll notice three stars that are marked in the west right here, Altair, Deneb, and Vega. That is the Summer Triangle, which, as we mentioned last time, is a pretty lousy name because it is going to be in our sky well into December. Uh, but it's still hanging on. It will until in the middle of next month, and uh, you, uh, you will be able to see that out there in the nighttime sky. Uh, very easy to pick out. Uh, and as we come around more to the southwest, you'll notice just setting at 8 o'clock this evening. Actually, this is running. This is current time. Let me do that so it isn't running. Back at it. You'll see, uh, actually, I'll back that up just a smidgen because they were setting below the horizon there. There we go. That's better. This is this is about 8.15, and this will be for the next couple of nights, too. We have Saturn and Jupiter in the nighttime sky, and you notice how close they are looking on my little chart here. And as I zoom in, you should be able to start seeing the moons of Jupiter as we get in close to it. There, that's Callisto over on that side. If I get in really close, you can see Ganymede over there, Io. And it looks like Europa is behind Jupiter right now. Uh, so, uh, you can see the four moons. And even if you got a really good pair of binoculars, you can pick that out. And then if we come up to Saturn and zoom in, you can see, well, look, it's showing Iapetus. Iapetus, you're probably not going to be able to see too well in your basic backyard telescope or any of these guys. But you can see Titan if you can distinguish that from a star. And you can see the rings of Saturn very clearly. Now, we'll talk about this uh, in a couple of... Uh, uh, shows from now, about four weeks from now. On uh, December 21st, we are going to have a conjunction between these two planets in the nighttime sky. They're getting closer and closer to each other. Now, eight o'clock, they're very low on the horizon. Remember, though, the sun goes down at around five o'clock. So between six and eight o'clock, these were going to be in great position. I was out walking, uh, I think it was Thursday night, and it was five five o'clock and I could see Jupiter already in the nighttime sky. So by 5.30 for sure, you should be able to pick those guys out in the nighttime sky. I'm gonna pull back a little bit more and come up and over. Uh, the moon was having a really neat uh, conjunction with Jupiter and Saturn this last week. It passed right by the two of them. It's heading for a full moon. It kind of looks full here on Stellarium until you get in close, then you can see we are just short of the first quarter moon. That'll be tomorrow night, actually. So we still have a very fat crescent moon in the nighttime sky right now. And then if you draw a line from Jupiter and Saturn go through the moon, that'll point you at the other bright thing. I could also see this by about 515 on Thursday night. That is Mars in the nighttime sky. Now we passed close approach with Mars on, um, in the middle of September. So it's not as bright as it was then, but we're still fairly close to Mars in the nighttime sky. And uh, there we go. You're not going to see it like that in many ground-based telescopes, but if you have a really big one, you can make it look like that. Uh, it's still pretty easy to pick out in the nighttime sky and still a pretty good object to hit with a telescope or a pair of binoculars in the nighttime sky. Now, um, Another star that you don't get to see too often here in Youngstown is this guy right here. That star is called Fommelhout, uh, which means the mouth of the southern fish. This constellation down here is Pisces Austrinus, or the southern fish. And I, like I said, I don't think, let me see if I can figure out how to get my outlines up there. I have this written down someplace. I'm just looking at my sheets trying to figure out where it is. There it is, it's C. So if I hit C, there we go. This is Pisces Austrinus, 
the southern fish. Uh, this actually goes back uh, to uh, where we get the names of these uh, objects to begin with. The constellations were invented by the Greek people. Their nomenclature, though, was to name, describe the stars as to where they are in the constellation. And the catalog we get them from came from an astronomer named Ptolemy, who uh, actually wrote the star name down literally in Latin as mouth of the southern fish. Well, when the library at Alexandria got sacked, uh, all that knowledge went to the four winds, but some people who preserved it were the Arabic people uh, who rescued a lot of the stuff. And one of their greatest astronomers was named Al Sufi. And he actually took uh, Ptolemy's work uh, it was renamed the Almagest. Uh, we don't know what the original Ptolemy title was, but he literally translated the book uh, and put Latin meanings from. So Fomalhaut actually means mouth of the southern fish, which is a direct translation from what Ptolemy said. That doesn't always happen. There are other stars that that is different on, and we'll see some of them if we come over here uh, to this part of the sky. And actually, I am going to move ahead a little bit in time now. Just get the, oh, that's a bit too far. But that does bring up the one we want to see. Please ignore these. Uh, I think I can turn those off. Hold on a second. Yeah, I thought so. Um, this is Orion the Hunter over here. And uh, Rigel, uh, is an Arabic word, and so is Beetlejuice. Those were actually, uh, this is his armpit, that's his left foot. You can see his belt right there. Let me just click on Al-Anam, which is another Arabic name, and you can see the outline of Orion up there in the nighttime sky pretty well uh, in the sky uh, as you look at that. But uh, some names uh, like Beetlejuice uh, we call that the armpit of the mighty one, but that actually was a name that came from the Bedouin Arabs. And even in the time of Tol uh, of the time of Al Sufi, the original meaning of the term was lost. They in named individual stars up there. Another one that's up here though that is named Al Debaran uh, is in Taurus the Bull, uh, and that means eye of the bull or bullseye in the nighttime sky as well. All right. So uh, those are a few things you can check out in the nighttime sky. We've got all sorts of uh, uh, good things you can pick out in the nighttime sky if you go out and take a look to the south. I oh, I need to uncheck that so you can see that a little bit better. And um, as we get further into the evening, this is tonight about uh, yeah, 11 o'clock or so that I moved us up to to see Orion, uh, but the whole winter circle is going to be above the horizon by that time. This will be rising earlier and earlier, and we'll talk more about that uh, in future star talks uh, when we take a look at some of the things in the nighttime sky. Something else uh, that you will see here is the planet Uranus is also up in the nighttime sky. This though, I think I can get in there, even if you know where to look for it, it looks like just another star in the nighttime sky. Uh, we did not figure out that was a planet until a gentleman named William Herschel figured it out in the 1700s. Even with no light pollution, uh, it still looks just like another star, but he figured it was moving against the background stars. Uh, so um, uh, it, it's hard to see uh, with most backyard telescopes. All right, with that, a uh, little bit of the background on the stars. I'm happy to answer questions about the stars. I hope some of you might have seen my segment on WFMJ where I talked about telescopes. As soon as they post that on their website, I am going to share that to Facebook. Uh, so uh, everybody can, if you're interested in getting a telescope, you can uh, learn a little bit about that. But uh, right now, I am going to uh, move on to our evening speakers. First up this evening, is going to be Eleni, and uh, she is going to talk to you about one of her favorite subject matters, and that is dark matter. Thank you, Kurt. <clears throat> so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully you all can see this. So as Kurt mentioned, 
I will be talking about dark matter, uh, which is the mysterious stuff that probably makes up about 27% of the universe. Uh, the rest of the universe is made up of dark energy, which we talked about in one of our previous Keep Looking Ups. If you didn't see it, you can check it out on YouTube. Uh, and the rest, that's about 68% of the universe. And the rest uh, is everything that we can see. Uh, you, me, the Earth, uh, everything else, the stars, galaxies, uh, that's about, that matter is about 5% of the universe. So I'm going to give you a little walkthrough of how the idea of dark matter came about um, and how our understanding has gotten better over time. I'll also talk about the possible composition of dark matter. We actually don't know what dark matter is made of, but we do have some ideas. Uh, and then I'll also talk about some possible skepticism that people have about dark matter. Uh, but before I talk about how dark matter was discovered and who discovered it, just some overview. Why do we call it dark matter? Uh, we call it dark matter because it doesn't interact with light. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't reflect light. Uh, so it's dark. Uh, we think we know that it's there. Uh, it has to be made up of something, so it is matter. But it doesn't give off light, hence dark matter. How do we know it's there? There are a lot of uh, observations that imply that there's more matter than what we can detect. I'll talk about a few of those, uh, but to talk about all of them would take a really long time. So I'll just cover the main ones. Um, and uh, it, it, it interacts with the matter that we can see. We call this baryonic matter, which is just matter that is made up of baryons, which are the things that make up atoms, which are what make up the elements on the periodic table. So uh, in school, you might have learned that atoms make up everything. That's not really true. Atoms make up all of the elements on the periodic table, which are the things that make up uh, everything on Earth and, again, the stars and the galaxies. But we now know that that is only a very small portion of all of the matter in the universe. There have been so many discoveries in the last century that have pointed to the existence of dark matter. Um, again, there are too many to talk about, so I'll just talk about the main ones. Uh, and the most convincing argument really for dark matter is that objects behave in a way that can only be explained by the presence of a lot more matter than what is giving off light. Again, that's the baryonic matter that I was talking about. So the first person, uh, really not the first person, but the person who coined the term dark matter uh, is this guy. This is Fritz Zwicky. Um, in the 1930s, he uh, very strongly pushed for the existence of dark matter, but his observations were not too great. He made a whole lot of assumptions. He was looking at galaxy clusters, uh, and he saw that the galaxies in the cluster were moving way too fast uh, than what we would expect. This had been observed before by other scientists like Edwin Hubble, who the Hubble Space Telescope was named after. Uh, but he did some calculations, and like I said, he made a lot of assumptions, but he found that, uh, he found that there should be 500 times more matter than what he was seeing. So he was just looking again at things that were emitting light, things that we can actually detect with telescopes. Uh, and he did some math, some calculations. He had to make a lot of assumptions because we didn't have that much information. And he found that there should be so much more matter than what we were seeing. So of course, he was met with skepticism. Um, like why would there be all of this invisible matter and he made a lot of assumptions so people basically just thought that he messed up uh, however throughout the 1900s into the the mid 1900s scientists continued to observe a lot of different objects and do calculations like so he did uh, and they found that the amount of mass or matter that should be present in these objects did not add up to just what they were seeing um, so people started to think maybe he was onto something. Uh, they 
had this ratio called the mass to light ratio where they calculated the amount of mass that should be in an object uh, and compared it to the amount of light that it was giving off. And almost all large objects in astrophysics had a very high mass to light ratio, meaning that there should have been a lot more mass there to explain the motions of these objects than what was actually being observed. This became known as the dark matter problem, but still in the mid 1900s wasn't really widely accepted or denied. People just continued to investigate it until the 1970s uh, where Vera Rubin came along and presented some of the strongest evidence for dark matter, definitely the strongest evidence up until this point. Um, if you have been following along on our page, we have been adding videos to our Life of a Scientist series where we talk about different scientists. And one of the episodes is about Vera Rubin. So if you have a minute, I definitely recommend checking that out. She has a very interesting life and a very interesting story. Um, but she studied the speeds of stars, gas, and dust in spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, um, which is also pictured here. Uh, and the way that she did this was using the Doppler effect. Uh, if you watched our exoplanet show, we talked about this a little bit, uh, but the Doppler effect applies to anything that travels in waves. So that's sound, light, uh, a common example of the Doppler effect that you've probably experienced is sirens like on a police car or a fire truck when they drive by, um, you can hear them change in pitch. Uh, the same thing happens to light waves. The color subtly changes. You can't see it with your eyes, but using precise telescopes and instruments, we can see the color of the light changing depending on whether the stars or the things that are emitting light are moving towards us or away from us. Um, and using that, we can tell how fast things are rotating around a spiral galaxy. Um, and she was looking at these spiral galaxies and what we expected to see was just like the solar system, we have uh, these laws called Kepler's laws that tell us how fast the planets should move. So the planets close to the middle, close to their host star, or in our case, the sun, uh, move really, uh, move faster. And as you get out towards the edges, things slow down. So people expected to see the same thing with stars and galaxies. Uh, but Vera Rubin was one of the first people to present strong evidence that this is not the case. Um, she looked at the galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy M31, which is the closest galaxy to the Milky Way, also a spiral galaxy. Um, and with the help of Kent Ford made a very precise spectrograph, which is uh, just something that does spectroscopy, which is how we look at these Doppler effect, uh, uh, the Doppler effect on lights to find the speeds of these objects. Um, and she saw that the objects around the edges of the galaxy, we expected them to be a lot slower. They were actually moving at the same speed. So as you got further out, everything was moving at the same speed, not slower like we see in the solar system or now that we've discovered exoplanets, we know that all planets behave like this. Um, this was really, really strange. Uh, and people had detected this before, but again, not this precisely. So uh, she continued to look at other galaxies and in the 70s, a lot of people started to really pick up on this and look at spiral galaxies. And this was consistent across all spiral galaxies. The only way to explain this was uh, by applying similar logic to what Fritz Zwicky did, do some calculations um, and see what we would have to change for this stuff to be moving so quickly. And the only thing that can account for that is extra matter. So at this point, dark matter was the best explanation for this and was starting to become widely accepted. Uh, most of this dark matter would be around the outskirts of these spiral galaxies uh, in a part of the galaxy that we call the halo. That's just the outermost part of the galaxy. Um, and that would account for everything moving faster than we would expect. Uh, since then, new evidence overwhelmingly supports Rubin's claims. People have been looking at this uh, in depth since the 1970s. Um, and more extensive research even shows that Zwicky was correct about his galaxy clusters, even though his original conclusions may have been because he made too many assumptions. 
um, evidence for dark matter is seen in uh, galaxy clusters as well as globular clusters and elliptical galaxies. At this point, evidence for dark matter is seen in almost all large objects throughout space. Um, another example is the bullet cluster, which is actually two clusters of galaxies colliding. Um, and again, when galaxy cl clusters collide, they're not really, the galaxies aren't crashing into each other. They're very, very spaced out and far apart. So they're passing through each other. Um, but there are gases between these galaxies and presumably dark matter. Um, and because the bullet cluster is colliding, then scientists expected to see something called gravitational lensing. If there was enough matter, dark matter, um, in these clusters and they were colliding and interacting, then we would be able to look through the clusters and see the light in the background getting warped. Uh, this comes from Einstein's sort of idea about space time. There's a very loose analogy that you've probably heard of um, where space isn't just empty space, it's actually um, time, energy, everything, and it's compared to a fabric oftentimes. So when you have a lot of mass in one area, think of something like weighing on the fabric and stretching it down. Therefore, when the light passes through that area, um, it sort of gets warped. So we call this gravitational lensing, just like when light passes through a lens, it looks distorted. Um, and this was observed in the bullet cluster. So that is very, very strong evidence of dark matter. Um, and this has been seen elsewhere too. Here's a good example. This is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the, you can see this, this ring shape of blue light that is a distant blue galaxy. And then the thing in the middle is a red galaxy, very massive red galaxy. Um, and it is causing gravitational lensing on the light from the galaxy in the background passing through it. Uh, and looking at these images and looking at this data, scientists can do calculations based on how much the light is distorted and determine how much matter has to be there. Um, and again, the, this has, as I mentioned before, a very high mass to light ratio. There has to be more mass there than just what they are detecting and picking up on. So even a lot of other things point to the existence of dark matter too, even observations of the cosmic microwave background, which is just kind of like the baby picture of the universe, the early universe, um, implies that dark matter exists. So you can't model the early universe without including dark matter because it would have been too hot. There's too much energy, too much uh, things are being pushed apart right after the Big Bang. Um, and the only way to explain things clumping together, like galaxies and large objects forming, uh, is if there was dark matter, if there was more than just what we're seeing. Uh, so, like I said, there's pretty much evidence of dark matter everywhere at this point. But what actually is dark matter? Uh, we, we know that it exists now, but what is it made of? This is one of the biggest questions in astrophysics and we still don't have a really good answer. It's easier to start by talking about what it's not. Um, some people uh, at first thought maybe it was cold matter that didn't emit a lot of light like gas, dust, dead stars, or even later on um, what we call rogue planets now that we've been discovering exoplanets or planets around other stars. Uh, we didn't discover them until, until about 30 years ago, um, but people thought, oh, well, maybe dark matter is just, there are a lot of these planets that have been flung out from their host stars and they're just out in space. Um, but these things still emit light. Uh, they, they emit infrared light and we would be able to detect that and uh, there's just not nearly enough of these things to explain the effects that we see from dark matter. Uh, and all this stuff, uh, gas, dust, dead stars, and rogue planets that some people still try to use to explain dark matter have been nicknamed MACHOs, which stands for Massive Astrophysical Compact Halo Objects. Um, but again, not a very good explanation because we would still be able to detect these things and we haven't. Um, so the next thing we can talk about then 
is what might dark matter be? So earlier I mentioned those baryonic particles, that baryonic matter that makes up the earth and the stars um, and everything that we can see. So everything else would be called non-baryonic matter. Uh, so that's how people are trying to explain dark matter now. Uh, but it's really difficult to prove this because non-baryonic matter doesn't really interact with baryonic matter, the stuff that we can detect. So we can't directly see this stuff. We do know that um, it does exist though. We've detected some things uh, in particle physics. Particle physicists uh, have a few different types of particles that could explain dark matter. Um, we call these weakly interacting massive particles. So they do have some mass. Um, so weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. Uh, and the most likely or popular example of these are neutrinos. We do know that they exist because the sun emits neutrinos. Um, there are three types of them. Um, just one of the types is the type that's emitted by the sun. And there are trillions of those passing through you at any given time. So we know they don't really interact a whole lot with baryonic matter, um, but they have been detected. And they were initially thought to have no mass. So that wouldn't really explain dark matter because it has to have mass to be interacting with this stuff. But we now think that they do have a small amount of mass. So if there were a lot of these things, perhaps that could explain dark matter. However, there's still a problem. Uh, people, particle physicists and astrophysicists have tried to model galaxies using the three known types of neutrinos, and it doesn't quite work. Um, so they're, they've proposed a hypothetical other type called sterile or inert neutrinos. Um, and again, many people argue that this is the best candidate, um, because even though we're not aware of a fourth type of neutrino, we do know that neutrinos exist. Um, and many of the properties of neutrinos do align with what we know about dark matter. But particle physicists have also proposed other types of particles uh, called neutralinos, axions, and photinos. Um, I don't know a whole lot of particle physics, so I won't get into that. But yeah, we still really don't know what dark matter is. Um, but we're getting closer every day, and lots of research is being done on this. So. One last thing, uh, even though there is overwhelming evidence for dark matter, people are still skeptical, of course, because we haven't detected it. Um, and it's a relatively new idea. Um, and one of the reasons people are skeptical is because of these things here. This is an ultra diffuse galaxy, which are uh, just very faint galaxies, don't have a lot of stars. They're very difficult to observe. Um, and cosmologists have tried to model these things. And in their models, they find that some of them should be entirely dark matter and some have absolutely no dark matter based on their models, um, which isn't very consistent. And people who are skeptical use this to argue that maybe our understanding of some aspects of physics are wrong and dark matter doesn't actually exist. We just have the wrong laws of physics. Um, but that's very difficult to prove. Some people have proposed modified models for these things, uh, but they're still not as good or as accurate as the models that scientists are using that do involve dark matter. Um, so most people don't think that's the case, but some people are definitely still skeptical. So yeah, astrophysicists astrophysicists have been trying to understand dark matter for a long time. They're still trying, um, definitely making progress. It's a very interesting concept. Um, and it's been refined enough that it's widely accepted now that dark matter is a thing. We just don't quite know what it is yet. Um, again, it's probably non-baryonic matter, not made up of atoms or the elements that we're familiar with. Um, and here's just one last picture of gravitational lensing again, because this is the closest I can get to showing you an actual picture of dark matter. So before we move on, does anyone have any questions? 
Uh, I don't see any in the comments right now, Eleni, but I do encourage people, this is cutting edge astronomy here. Uh, uh, if you do have any questions about what Eleni's talking about, please do share in the comments and uh, we will be sure to uh, answer those as we go through. And I love the fact that uh, dark matter is marked by wimps and machos. <laughs> Always fun. So yeah, fun acronyms. <laughs> so uh, speaking of wimps and machos, I'm going to turn you over to my boss now, who everybody says I'm an American version of his Canadian, but he's an American citizen now. So I don't think that's quite as apropos as it used to be when I first started working for him. But uh, with that being said, uh, now we're going to learn a little bit more about all these galaxies out there and. Uh, his area of speciality. I turn you over now to Dr. Patrick Durrell. And by the way, if you have any questions for Dr. Durrell too, put them in the comments and we'll be happy to uh, answer. He'll be happy to answer those as we go. Along. All right. Well, uh, thanks for everybody sticking around this evening. Well, I'm going to talk about a subject uh, that I'm quite uh, happy to chat about, and that is a study of what happens when galaxies collide. Now, you just heard a good, really good talk about, you know, dark matter and, and things in between the galaxies. Well, what about the galaxies themselves? Now, if you look online or if you've seen TV shows, you've seen pictures of galaxies, and here are some fairly typical, you know, galaxies, what we would call the regular galaxies, you know, your spiral galaxies and barred spiral galaxies, ellipticals, and even a class of galaxies we call irregular, which is kind of like the dog's breakfast of, of galaxies. They don't have any sort of real shape to them. And when people were classifying galaxies 90 years ago, this is mostly what they saw. However, uh, as people start taking more data and getting more images of galaxies, which is kind of a cool thing to do, because let's face it, galaxies are pretty neat looking things. Um, people noticed that there were a number of galaxies that looked strange, not irregular, not amorphous or blob-like or anything, but just weird. And the term they used was peculiar galaxies. And what's the difference between peculiar and weird? Well, you could debate that. But this is sort of an example. Of, these are Hubble images of what are called peculiar galaxies. And there's all sorts of different ones there. There's no one that looks exactly like the other. And starting in the 1960s, people started to wonder, what are these things? Uh, and in most cases, it looked like two galaxies or multiple galaxies. And what this is all about has to do with the fact that galaxies very often get a little too close to one another. And we want to know what happens when that, ha when that goes on. Now, again, the first atlas of peculiar galaxies, okay, I'm not just making this word up, uh, was in 1966. And these are, again, our Hubble images of some of the objects in this catalog by Halton Arp. Uh, so that's why they had these Arp numbers. It's named for the scientists who made up this catalog. And fairly soon, people started to understand that what we were seeing was the result of galaxies that were either colliding or merging or the more generic term interacting okay um now why does this happen and uh this image this is a this is a gal this is a very dense galaxy cluster where you have ten thousand galaxies in close proximity all held together by gravity and a lot of dark matter matter of fact a lot of these little string like things that you see in the image is the result of the gravitational lensing that Eleni just talked about. So it's, it's in these environments where people look for dark matter. But the thing is, is that these clusters have galaxies and they're all moving. And this is something that people don't, when you see a static picture like this, you don't automatically associate the fact that all of these galaxies, whether they're spirals or ellipticals or something in between, are moving around in the cluster. And very often galaxies will get a little close to one another. And the whole story of galaxy interactions is, well, what happens, okay? And like most things in astronomy, gravity happens, okay? You have a galaxy. Let's say you have a galaxy like a spiral, like the Milky Way, a disk with many, you know, 
couple hundred billion stars in it, surrounded by a halo of dark matter, and slowly works its way towards another spiral galaxy with a couple hundred billion stars and its halo or shroud of dark matter. Well, what happens? Well, the mutual gravity of both objects start pulling on the stars in each other's galaxy, and what happens is orbits get disturbed. Okay, And you start getting galaxies that look, well, just weird. And you start seeing galaxies, again, they don't look like spirals, they don't look like ellipticals, but they have all sorts of weird shapes. What I'm showing here is one of the most famous examples of this. This is a pair of galaxies called the antennae. Okay, uh, it's it, this object is so well studied, I believe there are even entire scientific meetings just on these two galaxies. And this is one of the peculiar galaxies. And it is, you see two weird features here, but you can also see where the name the antennae comes from. You see these very faint tails that are made up of stars that go out and it sort of looks like the antennae from a rather large insect. Okay, so hence the name. So what are these tails? Well, these tails are the result of two galaxies interacting. And some of the stars in these galaxies' orbits get so thrown out of whack, the stars end up way outside the original galaxy in these tidal arms. Now, this is a ground-based image that shows. So what is this thing in the middle? Well, it's actually two spiral galaxies in mortal combat, as it were. Okay, They got a little too close together, and the mutual gravity has distorted things and given you this object. Now, when did people start to figure this out? It was about 50 years ago. And because 50 years ago, computers were still in their infancy, okay? The computing methods that we're all familiar with now were still a long way off. But some scientists started using the, the rudimentary computers of the day to make very basic simulations of particles, because you can model gravity. Gravity can be an equation in a computer program. And they started modeling what would happen if you had two disk galaxies, like two Milky Ways getting too close to one another. Well, what happens is these stars get thrown out in these tails. This is a, an old simulation from a, one, of the, one of the most defining papers of the business by a pair of scientists in 1972. And if you rotate the, the simulation around, you get two disk galaxies and these tails. We call these tidal tails uh, because, you know, the fact that, you know, it's the same sort of gravity at work like what makes the tides on Earth that's caused by the moon. Okay, so we call these tidal tails. And even in their very basic simulations, you can see this. And you can, and people said, well, that looks like the antennae. And it's like, exactly. This is a Hubble image of the center galaxies of the antennae. And what you are looking at are two very messed up, very angry spiral galaxies, okay, that are grossly distorted by the collision, okay? Matter of fact, you see a lot of pink here. These are new gas, these are new nebulae and gas clouds that are forming stars ferociously as a result of the aftermath, okay? Because when galaxies collide, and this might be one of the strangest things, is when two galaxies collide, you think, boy, no, this galaxy's got a couple hundred billion stars, and this one's got a couple hundred billion. But when they actually get close to one another, there's enough space between the stars in a galaxy that the stars don't collide. And this is one of the things that, that might be really strange when you first hear about it. But the gas in the galaxies does run into each other and starts to form new stars. So it's like fireworks after these things happen. And there are lots of beautiful examples. Like, you know, even going to the Hubble Space Telescope archive, is, there's just many, many images of the results of galaxies that are about to collide or in the middle of colliding or the aftermath. If the galaxies stay close enough together, they'll actually merge. Okay, we call that a galaxy merger. Uh, this is another famous example. It's simply called the mice. Okay, and it too, is two spiral galaxies that have gotten too close to one another. And again, these days, we have much more powerful computers so we can do much more advanced simulations. So I'm gonna show a short video here, which shows you an early simulation 
what you have is two spiral galaxies. So again, think of these like two Milky Ways, but look what happens as they get too close. Now, this is a dance that takes period over hundreds of millions of years. Okay, so this is not something, it's not like a collision on Earth, which takes a fraction of a second for a fender bender. This is something that plays out over, you know, anywhere from three to five or 700 million years. But look at the how both galaxies are horribly distorted and tails of stars are thrown out in all sorts of directions. And what's going to happen in this simulation is the two galaxies, there's enough gravity pulling them together, they go at it again. And eventually the two galaxies will merge and become one. And over a long period of time, what used to be two spiral galaxies will actually turn into a rather ordinary looking elliptical galaxy. But what you should notice is look at all the stuff out here. Look at all these stars. They're not in the galaxies anymore. They're just kind of on the outside looking in. And now with telescopes these days, we can look for these things. I'll show a little bit of this clip. Same sort of thing. Again, two spiral galaxies, their mutual gravity pulling them close together. And you can see, and, and this is going to be interspersed with Hubble images of galaxies at different stages of the interaction process. Now, again, these simulations are done with very high end computers, not just your ordinary desktop. Many of the early simulations were done with the fastest supercomputers available. So this is one of the areas of astronomy that broke wide open with supercomputers and massive computing abilities. Okay. And there's just so many beautiful examples of these. One of the most famous interacting galaxies, often portrayed in, in magazines and online, relatively nearby galaxy called M51 or the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's a big, beautiful spiral galaxy, and you can actually see it on a dark night uh, in the springtime with a medium-sized telescope. But next to it is actually another galaxy. These two galaxies have interacted, and you can see all of the stars, all of this faint light out here as a result. And as you might expect, the little galaxy is, seems to be taking more of the punishment of the collision. Now, this galaxy has been modeled many times. I'm actually going to go back 17 years to a paper that myself and some colleagues wrote where we were studying this very galaxy. And uh, my colleague, who's an expert on these sorts of things, uh, Dr. Chris Miho is up at Case Western, is a world expert on galaxy collisions. And he did simulations on a computer farm that he had of one way to model the whirlpool. And we published this a while ago in 2003, and it shows how the little galaxy down here passed behind the big galaxy coming up from un underneath. And you can see the effects on both galaxies. And today, the galaxies sort of look like this, if you look at this bottom center. Okay. So in other words, the interaction started about 300 million years ago. Now. People are making more discoveries about these galaxies and refining the model. So this is not the final word, but this is how we learn about what goes on when galaxies interact. But even with that being said, some of the most beautiful images from the Hubble telescope, okay, or other ground-based surveys uh, are interacting galaxies. This is a galaxy uh, from a project uh, Adam, I'm involved. Yes? Quick question for you from Charles. Yes. Um, do we have an estimate on when the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy will collide? I'll get to that. It's about four or five billion years on a Tuesday. But I'll-, I'll, I'll After I'll, lunch, I'll, right? Yeah, sort of after lunch, yeah. Okay. There's lots of famous gr little groups of galaxies of multiple galaxies colliding. This one's called Seifert Sextet. Uh, and it's actually- well, it's a sextet because it looks like there's six objects, but there's actually four galaxies and one that doesn't belong. The sixth one here is actually far in the background, so it's not part of the group, but it's actually one, two, three, and four galaxies close together. So this is a multi-car pileup. 
and that this thing over here is the tail of stars that resulted from the interaction. Uh, I've been involved with various groups of people studying interacting galaxies for the last 20 years. This is another one of ours. And this is, again, one, two, three, and four galaxies close together. This is what we call a compact group of galaxies. Uh, four galaxies in close proximity. So they're all, the gravity is sort of pulling on each other uh, and including this tail of stars uh, that is being born out of the gas that's being pulled out of the system. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a beautiful color image. It's actually from data from a project I'm involved with uh, using the Canada France Hawaii telescope. So this is not a Hubble image. Uh, NGC 474 is a galaxy that in short exposure, it just looks like a normal elliptical galaxy. But when you take really deep images and you look for really faint features, you see all sorts of things. Okay. Matter of fact, our group just published a paper where we were studying this shell. It's not even a tidal tail. It's called a shell. And where we studied things in this shell, and it was probably one or multiple galaxies that merged with the big one to make these shells. So all sorts of wonderful things. A galaxy like this could be distorted by interactions. Uh, and as you look, as we collect deeper data with large telescopes, we see this kind of thing all the time. So even galaxies that we're familiar with, we take a deeper look, we see lots of these shells and features. They don't look nice and round or just like beautiful pinwheels. I mean, these are all galaxies from uh, some work that uh, recently got published. And all these galaxies, you see all these shells and tails of things caused by little galaxies getting eaten or getting absorbed by the bigger galaxies. So these kinds of things happen all the time. So galaxy collisions are not just a sort of one-off, isn't that cool? Uh, this has been happening with galaxies all throughout the history of the universe. Uh, even our Milky Way has ingested galaxies over its you know, 12, 13 billion year lifetime. Even the Andromeda galaxy, okay? You see beautiful pictures of Andromeda. It looks like a beautiful spiral. It's the nearest big one nearby. But when you take really deep studies of stars surrounding Andromeda, it too has these tails of stars from absorbed galaxies over its history. So even the Andromeda on the outskirts doesn't look like a nice pretty spiral. So even it is currently absorbing more galaxies. So galaxy collisions, it's not a rare thing. It happens all the time in the history of galaxies. Uh, to answer the earlier question, yes, the Andromeda galaxy, as we understand it, is actually coming towards us. Okay. Now, people are still debating whether it's coming right at us or it's coming at us at a bit of an angle. But at the speed that, that our two galaxies are moving, the expectation is that, yes, the Milky Way and Andromeda will interact, okay? And most of the interaction will happen in about four or five, sometimes I've heard six billion years. And when that happens, the two, again, the stars, the different galaxies, will have stars in different orbits. But again, most of the stars won't collide. So it's not like what's gonna happen to the sun we will just end up being part of a single elliptical galaxy when all is said and done, after the galaxies have interacted and the stars have settled down in their orbits. So it's a bit of a wait, but this is what could happen. Finally, I'm just gonna leave with this picture. Uh, this is my final slide. This is one of the most famous compact groups. It's the most heavily studied. It's called Stefan's Quintet. Uh, because it looks like five galaxies all right next to each other. It's actually four galaxies, this one, these two, and these ones. This one is actually in the foreground, okay? So it's actually not physically at the same distance as the other four. So it's one of the most well-studied interacting systems. But this is one that a lot of people may have seen pictures of without knowing it. Um, I don't know how many people online are fans of the Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Well, in the first two or three minutes of the movie, okay, you, the sound of the angels talking, you'll see this rather low-res image of galaxies. 
Well, next time you see It's a Wonderful Life, this is what you're looking at. As a matter of fact, if I recall correctly, the two galaxies that are talking at the beginning of that movie, this one and this one. Again, it's not. this is a Hubble image, so this is much higher quality than what was in a, a movie that was made in the 1940s. But look closely, and you'll see Stefan's quintet at the beginning of It's a Wonderful Life. So I'm more than happy to take questions just to give you a brief look at what happens when galaxies collide and all sorts of neat things that happen when they do. All right. Well, thank you there, Pat. Uh, we don't have any other comments up just yet on uh, Facebook. Uh, you're still mm -hmm. screen sharing there too, Pat. Oh, oop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, it, it, what I really like about working at YSU is working with uh, both Dr. Durrell and Dr. Feldmeyer, uh, who are actual working astronomers and seeing this stuff uh, as they discover it live. It, it's uh, Pat's working on another uh, a group uh, looking at the Virgo cluster and uh, periodically they get updates from the Hubble Space Telescope from the Virgo cluster group and uh, he's analyzing the data they're getting from Hubble and uh, that is just so cool. So um, well uh, with that uh, if anybody has any other questions like I said post them in the comments. Uh, we will if you're watching this after our live performance we will keep our eye on the comments too. If you have questions just list them there and we'll be happy to uh, answer them for you as uh, they come up as well. So. Um, we hope you enjoy looking at dark matter and galaxy interactions. Uh, we won't be here for Thanksgiving weekend. Obviously, our next Keep Looking Up is going to take place on December 5th. And uh, we are going to look at popular myths and misconceptions, like the fact that we're closer to the sun in summer, that the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, that there's a dark side of the moon, things like that. So uh, we hope you will join us on December 5th for that. Uh, you guys are uh, great. We wish we could be in the planetarium with you. We hope you do enjoy our time online. So we hope you guys have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. And me and the Astro Cat say happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And we hope to see you again on December 5th. And uh, we will uh, uh, talk to you then. To everybody, have a very safe Thanksgiving. And there's Elaine and Nishan. Be safe, everybody. Talk to you soon.